happy to announce that the Fretboard Journal now has three presenting sponsors. These are three brands that are behind us with everything that we do, including the podcasts and the videos, and they include Carter Vintage, Carter Vintage Guitars, where guitar lovers go for a good time, Gibson Guitars, only a Gibson is good enough, and last but not least, Martin Guitars. Martin Guitars and Strings remain the choice for musicians around the world for their unrivaled quality, craftsmanship, and tone can't thank these three brands enough for being presenting sponsors thank you guys hey gang welcome to the fretboard journal podcast i'm jason verlindy the publisher of the fretboard journal magazine as always as john rauhaus playing in the background these are strange times these are unprecedented times i look forward to folks listening back to this podcast in a couple years and this all seeming like a weird uh Thing from the past, but right now uh, we're all dealing with this coronavirus pandemic, and we are all holed up in our homes, and uh, it's a scary time for a lot of us. I'm feeling all of the emotions, sometimes all in the span of about 10 minutes. I know a lot of you are probably as well. Uh, the good news is, on our end, we can keep doing these podcasts, we can keep doing Luthier on Luthier, as well as the Truth About Vintage Amps podcast. And uh, we can do them from the comfort of our homes and continue to stay connected. As for the Fretboard Journal itself, we can work remotely and still put out the issues. Our printers have uh, been given the clearance that they are a essential business. So the electric guitar annual that we uh, need to put out is going to be coming out in a few weeks. Just about two, actually. And uh, issue 46 of the Fretboard Journal is going to be underway soon and mailing out in about a month so uh that is the news on our end obviously we're worried about the industry in general i'm worried about uh being a publisher during these times this is not an easy time it's never been an easy time but it's definitely not an easy time to be a publisher so i would love it if uh you've enjoyed these podcasts and interviews if you would finally join us and given the state of affairs in the world the easiest and fastest and most germ-free way to do it is just to get a digital subscription to the fretboard journal i'll include a link in the show notes it's thirty dollars i'm going to throw in two issues the last two issues 44 and 45 so you'll have 300 pages of reading out of the gate in pdf form and then you'll get the next four issues so six issues for thirty dollars no matter where in the world you are And I think it will uh, distract you and inform you, and it might just delight you because uh, it's what I've heard from a lot of people. On the uh, virtual front, we uh, decided to throw an impromptu guitar fest uh, on our website. So if you go to fretboardjournal.com, you will see that it's slowly getting taken over by something called hashtag FJFest. It's our place, a little placeholder where we are letting luthiers and craftspeople and musicians and collectors share what they are about, share their workshops, share their collection, give us a little history lesson, whatever you want. It's all community driven and we're picking the best and putting them there and on our social media and it's a lot of fun. And if you haven't been to it, uh, TJ Thompson just did a mind-bogglingly cool 30-minute long video tour of his amazing workshop back east Uh, we also have a lot of cool weird things that may not be on your radar a guy i've been following on instagram as who goes by dj lava lamp makes these incredible treble booster pedals his builds are incredibly clean he mines old parts from old reel-to-reels and stuff and i wanted to hear his story and so we got that so we're learning all sorts of cool things we've got a lot of little amazing music performances and it's all under the hashtag of fj fest So go check that out if you haven't yet. So I've been kind of struggling to figure out, we have a ton of interviews for this podcast in the can, as always, but uh, given the uncertainty and the weirdness of these times, I wanted to reach out to a sage of sorts. So I, I reached out to Richard Hoover of Santa Cruz Guitar Company. As you'll hear when I am first talking to him, he's always got this sort of zen-like aura about him. He is always even-keeled. He makes beautiful guitars, of course, and we talk about the making of those guitars during this podcast. But we also just talk about how he's hunkering down at home, what he's doing to keep his sanity, what he's thinking about. And I think you'll love this conversation. I really did. I'm really grateful that Richard took the time out of his day to do it. 
Uh, needless to say, if there are others in this industry that you would like to hear from in this format, shoot me a note, podcast at fretboardjournal.com. I welcome feedback all the time. Um, this is a small, scrappy little operation, and we're able to pivot as needed and do interviews as needed. And I definitely have interviewed a lot of folks over the last several years that you have all requested. So if there's someone you want to hear from, I'll do my part to reach out to them and see if they can be a guest on this podcast. But I think you'll like this conversation with Richard. Obviously, everything Santa Cruz Guitarist has done since the 70s has been incredible. And we talk about that. We talk about how he's kept his consistency, how he's kept, uh, he's protected fiercely what is important to his company and how he will continue to do so. Uh, What else can I tell you? Uh, We have a couple of sponsors, as always. I'm always singing the praises of Mono, the uh, gig bag company. If you go to monocreators.com, you can read up on them. They sponsor so many things that we do, including this podcast, and I will always be grateful to them. The reality is a bunch of you probably aren't gigging right now and not shopping for gig bags, but um, they also have pedal boards, they also have backpacks, and they also are the same company behind the rebranding of Tysco and Harmony, and I encourage you to go take a few minutes, uh, see what they're up to. They have some amazingly cool stuff right now. Tysco unveiled an interface pedal that lets you basically have your whole pedal board and USB it right to your computer, so you can do all sorts of recording, uh, and it does more than that. I'm simplifying it. Harmony has so many cool guitars available right now, and the coolest thing of all is everything they do is is so affordable. They are also the the folks behind Heritage and, and breathing a ton of new energy and life into that brand uh, here in the States. So, uh, check out everything they do. And again, monocreators.com is the way to read up on mono. Uh, our other friends who are sponsoring this podcast, as they always do, our friends at Retrofret Vintage Guitars in Brooklyn. This would normally be the time I would tell you to go to their showroom in Carroll Gardens if anyone's in New York City. But as with almost every guitar store I know of in America right now, they are closed and, and just kind of staying safe at home. But They are still adding to their inventory, and they are still shipping all the time. So I encourage you to go over to retrofret.com. By all means, tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. We have been lately talking a lot about vintage amps around here because we do a podcast called The Truth About Vintage Amps. How about the Gibson GA50 owned by Steely Dan's Walter Becker, available right now. It's from 1950, 1600 bucks. Doesn't seem like a bad deal. I'm guessing a bunch of you out there are like me and kind of uh, trying to fill your days and fill your hours with entertaining things. Uh, They have a Gibson Style A mandolin that looks like it's been played to death, but I'm imagining it sounds incredible and it's just $1,250. Man, I I keep watching these Sierra whole live streams and going, I really should try the mandolin a little bit. That is a very tempting offer. They also, also from the Walter Becker collection, have... His Bacon and Day Senior Rita, if you really want to sound and look, if you really want to look like John Fahey in his prime, that is the guitar for you. That is the uh, super blinged out headstock everybody should have over there just to see how beautiful guitars can be, because those are amazing. Head on over to RetroFret.com. Obviously, if anybody reaches out to them, tell them the Fretboard Journal sent you. That is all I have for you right now. If you're anything like me, you've probably been absolutely inundated with live stream videos and Zoom conference calls and podcasts and uh, news and everything else, and you probably just want to hide under the covers. Uh, But I promise you, we have some great content coming, and you will enjoy it and love it. And so by all means, I hope you will follow us. I hope you will support us again at fretboardjournal.com by becoming a subscriber. I will include a link in the show notes. Uh, this is a incredible community that we are all a part of. People like Richard are why the Fretboard Journal exists. And I am so happy and grateful that I can continue to share their story. I know that this is going to be a hard time for all of us. But uh, I want to pull together, as Richard sort of says, and make this happen and make some beauty in the world. So uh, that's all I got. We've got some great stories coming out. Check out the FJ Fest content if you haven't yet. And everybody, wash those hands. Don't touch your face. And know that we love you. Morning, Jason. How are you, Richard? Relatively peachy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> given, given all that we have to be concerned about, 
I got a, I got a, just a spectacular team I work with, and I'm really proud of them. Yeah, so uh, where are things standing for you guys? Is everyone out at their homes, like you guys, this this factory temporarily shut down? Um, we are uh, uh, under a statewide uh, mandate to shelter in place, mm-hmm. and that uh, uh, we're categorized as a non-essential business um, as opposed to a hospital or a hardware store or a, a car mechanic or some. It's really kind of comical, some of the divisions there. And what that means is that we can't be um, uh, operating a, as usual. So we can't make guitars. Uh, there are the provision that we can uh, take measures to prevent inventory spoilage. And the other one is uh, an exemption for uh, activities of a business that supports people's ability to work at home. So we have a little bit of wiggle room in there uh, uh, on the uh, on the first one, you know, um, maintaining humidity, security, uh, having a presence, uh, getting deliveries and things like that seems to be OK. And on the latter, um, uh, that uh, means that, uh, it could, you know, it could mean that, that uh, fixing people's guitars or shipping out repairs or things like that could be uh, considered okay. But, uh, you know, from my point of view, it's really the spirit of this that is the most important thing to pay attention to. And, uh, uh, you know, as much as anything, uh, as you know, somewhat opinion leaders in our community, we want to set a good example and do the right thing. Sure, that was a mental huh? No, I'm even in the uh, cacophony of the Nam floor showroom. You always exude this sort of zen <laughs> about you. <laughs> I've never <laughs> seen you phased. I'm just curious, with a period like this going on, where we're all kind of forced at home, what do you what do you focus on? Are you thinking strategy for next year's Santa Cruz models? Are you using this as a time to reflect and and just be close to a loved one, or where do you go with it? Because I think everyone has a different strategy. You know, um, all of all of the above. And I think a real good way to put it is it's almost a logic array. And uh, uh, the first thing that I do with incoming is, is this something that I have any control over? Yeah. And so that goes to the action box. And if there, if I have no control over it, um, uh, maybe I'll just park that for later information or I'll just ignore it completely. And, uh, 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 so I, I, my job here right now as the boss is to um, uh, attract uh, funding uh, to see us through uh, in times of no income, uh, to ensure that people have unemployment um, benefits and that those unemployment benefits don't set someone up for ineligibility for other programs. There is such an incredible amount of information out there and some conflicting offers for benefits. So uh, sorting this uh, sorting this out is pretty much a full-time job. Uh, we're getting the documentation for Small Business Administration uh, uh, as well as working with the bank and uh, one of the, you know, uh, again, you ask a simple question, but I'm anticipating some of the things that might be of interest to others here as I run on. And one of those is um, uh, this is the time where we really benefit from our true savings account, and that is our bank of goodwill. And that's been built over, uh, you know, our whole whole history, um, uh, you know, one simple act of a kindness for others at a time. And at times like these, we, we get the benefits from it. Um, you know, going to a bank with, uh, numbers alone, uh, there's a line going around the block three times with people doing that. So, uh, really our hopes are uh, based on the connections we had with individuals within the bank that came to our jams and Christmas parties and celebrations. And, uh, you know, have a nice feeling when our application yeah. comes. 
So that's a, that's a, a, a message I, I really have for everybody in this is, uh, you know, uh, keep a co- cool head and um, be kind to one another and wash your hands. <laughs> yeah, don't touch your face. <laughs> <laughs> or my face. <laughs> yeah, so it, it really is, um, um, it's a place where you really, uh, unfortunately, we notice the um, an amplification of of human selfishness in this, but it's not as prevalent as the um, acts of, acts of uh, help and kindness towards one another, and those really stand out at a time like this. And that's has uh, I think that's actually more virulent than the uh, disease itself. Um, uh, the way people. Uh, treat us and we pass that on to others. So that's my big job right now is to uh, be considerate of everybody else and uh, try to facilitate some uh, normalcy and uh, uh, feeling of security in this. Wow. I, I knew you'd have a good answer. Uh, <laughs> well, it's, my best. it's the best I, one I've come up with. I mean, <laughs> obviously you're a a product of the sixties and everybody, including us has mentioned, you know, you, you moved to Santa Cruz in the mid seventies and the rest is history. You've been at it ever since. Where did you actually grow up? Um, I grew up, uh, uh, right, uh, almost midway between Fresno and Bakersfield in the middle of the uh, California, San Joaquin Valley. And that's, um, uh, you know, mostly rural agricultural, uh, uh, you know, salt of the earth stuff, and uh, uh, grateful for it. It was a great place to be a kid. And and what were your parents like? Uh, my my uh, father was a. I still have trouble describing his job. Uh, uh, he did uh, commercial art in the sense of remember before the internet uh, when uh, the stores on Main Street. Uh, had a boxed in window and you went by and you looked at uh, their goods and uh, seasonally uh, there was little dioramas of, of, you know, Santa Claus or the Easter bunny and stuff like that to promote their products. And that's what my dad did. He made that stuff. Sometimes it was animated, uh, sometimes not. And he worked in plastic, glass, metal, uh, uh, glitter, anything uh, to, you know, to convey that, that, that uh, message of the the business that was inside. And so he worked at home on that. And I was exposed to um, that kind of, that kind of art craft, if you will. So it, uh, uh, we, we had a lot of opportunity to take things apart, make our own toys. And uh, so making things and discovering things was really a part of, of uh, my growing up. Now, you know, like all of us guys, unfortunately, it was my dad, so I wasn't in- interested at all in what he did, but it rubbed off you yeah. know, over time. So you lived in a small rural area. Did he have to be on the road a lot to service all these storefronts? Yeah, a lot. So he, you know, uh, this is the day before franchises, and uh, uh, for people that didn't live in that area, let me let me just get, paint you a little picture is, uh, you know, you go into the local drugstore, stationery store, whatever. They weren't franchises, nationwide franchises that you bought and they supplied all the signage and graphics and, and the standard of procedures that you operated by. It was uh, your neighbors that were figuring out how to try to run a business and they needed somebody like my pop to uh, make their signs and their graphics and, and uh, the stuff in the store that we take for more for granted now. Um, so, you know, it was, as I look back on it, it was a pretty fun thing, uh, to do and observe. Yeah. And then what'd your mom do? My mom was the, uh, she, uh, where to start with that? Uh, she was, uh, she was, a, she played the piano and, uh, that was in the house, you know, always. And, and again, seasonally. Uh, so we played and sang. Uh, that was my exposure to music, but her day job uh, was uh, teaching, and she taught. Uh, she started out in a one-room schoolhouse in Nebraska uh, with kids from uh, four years old to eighteen, you know? mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, met met my dad in a bar in Laguna Beach in the, in World War II, 
and uh, ended up moving to the middle of the San Joaquin Valley where she continued teaching, but she also was a superstar librarian. And, and, and that, uh, uh, since she was the Google of the time, before computer access, if you wanted to get information to write uh, a book or an essay or a school assignment, you went to my mom and she found out the resources. It, it wasn't instantaneous like we enjoyed today. You waited until the books came in and you got your resources. So it, it, if we combine those two things, if I can jump ahead one, uh, between those two, thus my uh, success as I know it as a guitar maker, um, my father gave me the inquisitiveness to take my first guitar apart, and my mother um, uh, gave me uh, actually the stern directions to get the books to look up how to put it back together. Mm -hmm. And here I am today. <laughs> Was your dad watching you while you took apart that first guitar? Or did that come later? Uh no, my my dad uh, my dad came from uh, uh, Texas, was is almost where I was born, and uh, uh, really boy, talk about rural background. His uh, mother died in childbirth, and his um, uh, father uh, just rented him out to the to the relatives and neighbors to plow, and he uh, got on a freight train in the Dust Bowl. I'm sorry, I had to pause there. This is. No, it's okay. He's kind of moving. I never tell a story. Yeah. And uh, uh, ended up in art school in L.A. in the 30s. And uh, 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 talk about, you know, that uh, how do you keep them down on the farm after they've seen Paris? Yeah. My dad went to World War II and, and came back with a, a whole different worldview and uh, um, saw his uh, place in the world in service to others. Uh, rather than as a plowboy, and that's how he applied his art. Both my 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 folks had a real uh, a real uh, um, I, I, you know I just I have to say uh, altruistic streak that uh, um, fortunately or unfortunately rubbed off on me. So anyway, that that's uh, <laughs> that's a good beginning, and the uh, practicality of growing up. Uh, in in that society, like kind of agrarian society and rural and so forth, um, gave me a real good foundation for everything I've done since. Yeah. And what was your first stop after the San Joaquin Valley? Where did you go after? Did you finish high school? Um, yeah, I did. I finished high school. Um, I had uh, made a few trips to uh, uh, Santa Cruz. And, I, you know, what I may have told you this story before, but I want to, uh, I want to trip selling subscriptions to the Fresno B door to door, my little uh, bike paper route mm -hmm. uh, to Santa Cruz, to the beach and boardwalk. And uh, uh, when uh, we got on a bus in, um, uh, in, the, in the courthouse square, and we went to each little valley town to pick up another paper boy, and uh, it was July, probably 103. <laughs> and we ate candy all the way uh, through Gilroy up over Hecker Pass that drops down into uh, Monterey Bay. And as we came over that uh, pass, we dropped into the Redwoods, and it was cool, and it was foggy, and it was where I, I I wanted to live. And at that point, at nine years old, I went, I'm moving here. And uh, uh, so I, I was able to uh, come a few times, but I got caught and had to go home. But I did graduate high school. And uh, I did go to college because your choices were college or Vietnam. It was really that simple back then. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, I really, really rebelled against that. I could not get what I wanted out of it. So um, I, uh, uh, a lot of Senator Deputy here, but let's jump ahead. I went to uh, Northern New Mexico to join a bunch of expatriates from the University of Montana to start our own uh, alternative university. And that was uh, uh, after, you know, hitting the road, doing my uh, uh, Jack Kerouac uh, trip. <laughs> Wait, um, were I, you in Montana? Is that how you met these guys, or you just stumbled upon a bunch no, of Montanans? No. This was, um, yeah, this is uh, uh, back in the time when we wrote letters <laughs> and developed networks the hard way. Yeah, and uh, actually got that lead. Uh, 
uh, hitchhiking. I'd gotten dropped off uh, uh, in Santa Monica, and some people picked me up that were familiar with this group and made the introduction. And uh, so I joined those guys to, uh, uh, you know, uh, I I wanted to learn, uh, but the hubris of youth, I decided I'd start my own university and teach myself. <laughs> <laughs> What a, what a <laughs> that must have been a fun conversation with your folks. So I'm going to university, but I'm I'm helping make one. Yeah, yeah, no, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, uh, it, it didn't flow. It wasn't a flowing <laughs> conversation. So, uh, funny. so uh, I'm guessing this school didn't end up becoming uh, Ivy League. What what happened at it? Um. Uh, yeah, it was great. This is um, but this is outside of Santa Fe, about 20 miles uh, up at the tail end of the Rockies, and it was uh, it was called the Glorietta School, and out of that came uh, just oodles of uh, uh, different. Uh, it was a seedbed for a lot of different enterprises. But what we did is uh, uh, we did a lot. Uh, we you know we assigned ourselves uh, uh, study towards uh, degrees, and mine was in environmental ar- architecture because we had to build out of adobe and natural materials and that kind of thing. So our the network that we developed from that uh, uh, brought us in contact with, uh, you know, different communities around the country. And uh, we all threw together uh, to apply for a, uh, a grant from the then Department of Health, Education, Welfare to do a study on youth and the drug culture, which we knew a little bit about. And uh, uh, that that uh, connection uh, also served me well t- today in in where I am. So I, you know, to catch you up uh, to date, um, I got offered a cowboy job in Montana uh, at that point, and so the the course was being a uh, um, you know a researcher of seeking seeking government grants, uh, being the next Bob Dylan. Uh, or going to Montana to be a cowboy, which I'd done some in northern New Mexico. Uh, and uh, one of the one of the uh, attendees at the conference we had for the study on youth and the drug culture was my darling wife, who was in a community in Berkeley, and that derailed everything. And then <laughs> we, she was the art director at Ramparts Magazine, you know, the wonderful old uh, leftist uh, periodical. And uh, uh, she had to come out to Berkeley once a, once a month to work on that. And uh, I decided to go back to being the next Bob Dylan and moving back to the Bay Area so I could, uh, you know, get discovered and published and life would be good. Wow. So did you have, <laughs> did you ever go to Montana and be a cowboy? No, uh, uh-uh. oh. that uh, I was, uh, I did, the, I did some, you know, the, you know, cowboy stuff. Uh, the reality of cowboy stuff is not yippee yi kayo riding a horse when you talk and sing it. It's like building fences and slugging through stuff and all that. And I did that also in northern New Mexico. While you know, uh, you got to have a day job to support the the counterculture stuff that I was doing. Uh, but I didn't make it to Montana. I I uh, uh, you know met my now wife. And uh, decided to go back, uh, you know, and, and really get serious about the music thing and uh, came back. Santa Cruz was the, the common denominator here. Both of us needed the access to a city to do what we wanted to do. Uh, uh, my wife was uh, had been a runway model in Manhattan, so she was all urban. And I could not stand that. It scared me to death. I wanted to be rural. So we chose uh, Santa Cruz Mountains as a place to live. And we had access uh, to the city for the things we needed to do. Wow. I'm waiting for you to come out with a cowboy guitar with a stencil that shows the boring aspects of cowboy life. But You know, that was, uh, that was, my, uh, you know this, but my, uh, my stage name was Otis B. Rodeo. That's mm-hmm. what I performed under. And that's what I built my first guitars under that name. And, uh, and that's what I did, you know, um, the, the whole cowboy ethos was really dear to my heart because I, I uh, grew up watching that on TV. And uh, uh, um, you also know this part of my story is I could not learn fast enough because there was no network at the time. There was no books or videos 
a course on guitar making. And that's why I got uh, together with some partners to, you know, amplify our efforts and do that. And neither of those was really warm to the idea of cowboy guitars. So now, you know, it's a Santa Cruz guitar company. So what, what, a, what a trajectory. Thank you. Oh no, thank you. I mean, we could just spend, I think, two hours just talking about uh, the. I want to just hear more about this college, but uh, was was you, you need to hear your story too? Oh, Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, all along the way, based on what you kind of saw growing up and your dad doing, were you always? It sounds like you were kind of always building stuff, no matter where your roof was over your head. That's right. Um, uh, you know, I did the, um, I did the, uh, you know, auto mechanics and the fix it stuff and, uh, the furniture and things like that, no matter where I was, uh, uh, with more or less access to, to tools, uh, and so forth. So, you know, one of the things that's awesome about growing up in, uh, uh, you know, uh, a little closer to, to uh your sources is you learn how to do stuff uh with with limited materials and uh that's always been something i've been grateful for um so yeah i uh you know one there's a couple things i'm also very grateful for is somehow i dodged the bullet of making something like dulcimers which really would have headed me off in a <laughs> <laughs> and nothing against dulcimers, you know, uh, but uh, that was uh, that was kind of a a cultural uh, a little road that went off a cliff somewhere in the uh, early seventies. Um, so luckily, I got into guitars. How many? It's, it's uh, fascinating to think of how many Richard Hoover and Bob Taylors of the world ended up taking the dulcimer <laughs> path, and we've never heard from them ever again. Oh man, yeah, the road not taken. One of mine was uh, one of my neighbors uh, was a, a, a pretty famous uh, astro business, and his hobby was playing in a baroque band uh, with woodwinds, like you know, she's the things that flugelhorns, okay. uh, stuff that looked like wooden intestines uh, uh, with the with reeds on them that you that people played, and I thought that was fascinating, and I I came close to doing that. Um, you know, making uh, uh, antique uh, musical instruments. Um, I also had a brush with architectural models before, uh, you know, we had the ability to make this stuff with lasers and computer. People made these cool little uh, models of buildings and, and houses, and that was really fun. Wow. All these directly to be a guitar maker, don't you? <laughs> so what was the moment where you, you decided to figure out how to build a steel string guitar? This is um, awesome serendipity. Um, I, uh, uh, you know, you knew my story uh, more than most. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're, we're pals along the way. And uh, one of the things that... Uh, I, I realized I really wanted to do, as all young men, is I want to make a difference. Uh, you know, I want to do something that was durable and lasting. Uh, and uh, uh, realizing, well, I don't. I never realized I wasn't going to be the next Bob Dylan. That was just an evolution, mm -hmm. you know, a painful evolution rather than a reality. Um, uh, that uh, uh, the songwriting stuff uh, and the writing, the, the you know, the message was really important to me um and but once i i built my own guitar uh that all changed and here's how it happened um i had saved and saved and saved uh to get uh you know a d18 and then later a d28 and uh uh that was i was in heaven um i lost the uh, d28 um uh, i got stolen off a porch when i was distracted uh, at about, I don't know, uh, 19 there, I guess. And um, I uh, uh, I had to get a new guitar. And uh, I found an Epiphone Texan that I sure, 64, that I wish I'd held on to. And uh, the music store didn't finance, but they sent me down the street to a uh, little uh, storefront place that would take your wedding ring or your car title and, and loan you money. Um 
and uh, uh, I uh, hawked my uh, 62 Volkswagen bus title for a loan for enough to buy the Epicone Texan. And the loan officer uh, was Bruce McGuire, who um, uh, showed me a clipping. He said, oh, you know, and I also told him I'm a musician, and uh, my, one of my dreams was to make guitars. And he showed me a newspaper clipping uh, of, of himself as a guitar maker. He was a, uh, uh, let's see, uh, he was a protege of Art Overholzer, who w- w- wrote one of the early interesting books on classical guitar construction, and he'd helped uh, Art uh, write that book. And I saw that, and I, I forgot about the loan, and I said, what day of the week is best for me to come by and learn how to make guitars from you? Wow. That was the that was the real tipping point, and actually the answer to a prayer I had uh, about just looking for uh, looking for direction. You know, looking for a good good way to uh, be of service, be of use, be useful, uh, uh, leave something durable and lasting. Which unfortunately was the ego part of it that can really slow you down. So uh, Bruce, uh, uh, amazing guy, he passed away a couple years ago, sitting on his surfboard and on Thanksgiving day, which couldn't have been better way to go for no, him. Yeah. And he, he really uh, did a remarkable job of uh, showing me uh, the fundamentals. Of course, we're working with classical guitars. And uh, um, again, I'm anticipating some of your questions, but uh, he had limits as a classical builder in showing me what I wanted to do, which is of course, make a Martin looking thing. Um, and, uh, uh, we we both discovered this guy that worked for uh, 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 the city as a printer, uh, James Patterson, who wrote the seminal book on pearl inlay way back when. And uh, uh, Jim uh, took me in to show me how to make do things like a dovetail joint and and inlay and some of those other things. So there's a thread that uh, brought me to the guitar making. And uh, this was all in Santa Cruz. And those guys are both unsung heroes, real pioneers. I better pause there because I'm, I'm all of a sudden giving you the interview here. No, this is fantastic. Uh, so, yeah, they, these guys were all within a few miles of each other and there just happened to be. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah. I... Now, well, you know, I, I was I was uh, uh, reserved here a little bit ago. Uh, some I don't you know, I don't rebel against the, uh, when people go, oh, Santa Cruz, oh, the hippie influence. Uh, I see where you're coming from. Uh, but uh, I want to give a defense for Santa Cruz. Uh, Santa Cruz has been uh, uh, quirky, uh, weird uh, uh, and, a, and a refuge um, uh, for expatriates. Uh, not not since the 60s, since the 1860s. This has always been a place where people came uh, to do uh, things a little bit out of the ordinary and find tolerance and acceptance. And uh, so that's the fit for us. Uh, uh, I'm not ashamed of any of my hippie influences. You know, I, I, uh, I was part of that. Uh, however, it goes a little deeper than just that, too. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, it's I, I, I'm very fond of Santa Cruz. I used to go there for every, every a week every summer when I was growing up yeah, in Sacramento. Cool. It it was always a magical place, and uh, and we'll always be. Yeah, San Joaquin Valley uh, kids, and it was a, a hundred and ten there, and then there was the beach. Good yeah. job. Yeah. So at this point, though, before you met these two guys. Uh, yeah, you you knew about Martins. You had an Epiphone. Uh, were you reading like the was the whole Earth catalog around at this point? Did you know that there were people out there building steel string guitars, and you just didn't know how to connect with them, or was this all a myst- mysterious world to you? Well, no, that's good. That's good. Now, e- even though it was you know pre-internet. Um, uh, networks, uh, in some cases may have been even more dense and profound. And, uh, I, uh, I, to to tie in some loose threads here, um, I was, um, uh, uh, hitchhiking up through Berkeley to, um, uh, visit Overholzer, you know, on a, on a pilgrimage. And, uh, I stopped in Tupper and Reed music store and that's where John Mello was working a thousand years ago. 
and uh, 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 that that thread uh, introduced me to people of the Portola Institute, Stuart Brand, the people that wrote the Whole Earth Catalog. Oh wow! And uh, my I spent you know I spent a, a time in San Francisco uh, with that influence, and uh, that's a really important part of my. Uh, upbringing to the whole, you know, alternative education university stuff uh, that inspired me. And yes, the whole earth catalog was there, which was an incredible resource. You know, the, the whole earth catalog was like the internet um, uh, where you could get resources, things you'd never heard of. So within that was uh, uh, later on was um, uh, you've got me here. The first book on uh, the first, Nice book on guitar making, uh, and I, the guy's name's escaping me. Irving Sloan. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the first one was on classical guitars, and I'd already been there. I was after the steel string thing. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm taking off a, a thread there that that doesn't dead end it, but it's part of it. I'm glad you mentioned Whole Earth Catalog. Man, what a cultural uh, icon and uh, a game changer. Well, I, I had known that you'd probably read it i didn't know you actually knew and had been to like the headquarters of it that's kind of really interesting well headquarters is a pretty broad thing <laughs> but, but, <laughs> cultural movement is an office but uh you know you being in the fourth estate uh magazines and newspapers and so forth everybody used to be in the same building that's pretty uh interesting huh yeah yeah well we until uh three weeks ago the most of the fretboard journal was all three of us were under one roof but now uh now we're spread out, but, uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, yeah. I've ha I can't tell you how many times I've had to explain and I'm, you know, I, I'm in my mid forties, but I've had to explain to people under the age or, but it seems like if you're younger than about 45, you have no idea what the whole earth catalog was, but for those of us who've seen it, or at least seen the scans of it, it, it was a pretty magical thing. Oh man. Or, or the, the impact, the context of that. Yeah. yeah good for you. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it, you know, I mean, I think it's being in the guitar media world, it's it's interesting to see, uh, you know, what was ostensibly a catalog, but you also learned a lot. Like, it, it sent you down so many <laughs> rabbit holes. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, I think the internet was supposed to be like that, but somewhere along the line, it, it kind of lost its charm. Uh you can still obviously find a YouTube video for anything you want to learn, whether it's how to build a, you know, put a roof on your house or whatever, but it's, it's not, it's not as plug and play. I don't know. Oh man, that's, you know, that's so well put. That's beautiful. Uh, you know, you said a rabbit hole It's more like, uh, you know, going through the keyhole and, and going into a, a wonderland. And unlike the internet, it was free of malice and uh, 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 beautiful, guileless uh, introduction to the alternative world that we that we hadn't seen before. Yeah. So we're uh, <laughs> we're in the early '70s now in our timeline. I think uh, was there ever you mentioned the dulcimer thing, but was there ever a thought of something other than the world of guitars? Of, of you, you know, pursuing? Was there any other art in you that you wanted to put out into the world? Well, I, you know, I had um, I, I really grew up uh, with art influences, uh, not only my my through my parents, but also through uh, you know through school, and uh, um, you know uh, 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 drawing, ceramics, uh, all that kind of stuff uh, fascinated me. But one of the you know we talked about um, uh, you know I went through the usual progression. Um, of I started out as a kid wanting to be an archaeologist and a pharmacist and a fireman, then a cowboy, you know, and finally a, a, a guitar maker. Uh, but in the midst of that, uh, to what you're asking, this also comes from the Whole Earth Catalog. Is um, um, I met uh, uh, John Muir, and I'm going to pause there just for dramatic effect. Not that John Muir. <laughs> I'm not that old. Uh, but I met John Muir, the guy that wrote uh, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, Guide to Fixing Your Volkswagen for the Complete Idiot, which was really a, uh, again, a, uh, a embryonic uh, thing that showed people um, 
uh, how to explode the myth of specialization, and you could do things like fix your own car. And uh, uh, that led to, you know, a whole movement today of do-it-yourself stuff. Uh, but that was a, that was a neat association and that introduction to people that they could be uh, do something they thought was so specialized they could never pull off, like rebuild their own engine and so forth, uh, led to uh, led to some really fun uh, uh, stuff. Uh, from that, we developed a, um, a uh, really a crisis counseling center in in Santa Fe for uh, you know young people. That was a really funny time. You know, people went uh, went off to uh, Ivy League colleges and got introduced to um, uh, drugs, some good, some bad, and some ended up in real trouble. And Santa Fe was a crossroads uh, for old Route 66 and a lot of people on the road and a lot of people in trouble. And that almost uh, became my career uh, in uh, in that counseling crisis intervention uh, uh, and on and on. Uh, unfortunately for all of us, doing that kind of work uh, is just like an EMT, a fireman, or a cop. You only have so much empathy and compassion before you tend to get a little bit burnt and start categorizing people's uh, situations um, uh, and uh, being a little less uh, sensitive. So I saw that coming and, and uh, ducked out of that. So uh, I missed, I dodged some really good bullets here. <laughs> <You> <laughs> <did>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. You you uh, bring out the best or worst of me here. No, I yeah, these are these are amazing. So let's let's bring let's fast forward this. You're you know, uh where where are you at today with Santa Cruz? How much of a Santa Cruz guitar do you touch? Um what are you most excited about? Um I'm uh uh, I'm still thrilled with this. You know, we're in our, we're approaching our 44th year uh, in this. Uh, the team has grown uh, 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 really slowly but steadily from just me to um, today. There's probably um, 21 people in the whole company. And we have uh, uh, we've always specialized in custom work, uh, building, uh, you know, one off guitars for actual players, uh, but it, 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 it was out of necessity, a smaller part, uh, percentage of what we did when we started out, we were pioneering the boutique concept and, uh, uh, to attract stores, attentions and customers, we had to make guitars that look somewhat like a Martin or a Gibson, or we wouldn't have made any progress. So fast forward to today, um, where really we are a custom shop and we're building for people, uh, not only what they want in uh, choices of wood, cosmetics, function like the shape of the neck, but we really are custom building for sound. And to make that uh, clear, that that means anything that you can manipulate on your own sound system at home is a personal choice, and we can uh, manipulate the uh, woods and the structure to get those particular points of of uh, uh, for a player. Um, we can also, uh, coming from the violin tradition, which I left out of this, <laughs> this whole discussion, uh, but coming from the violin tradition, uh, 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 I learned early on uh, that control of the qualities of sound that, that are common to all of us, which is sustain and complexity of overtones, is doable um, that information just isn't as available. And that's the foundation that we built the company on is making consistently great sounding guitars in sustaining overtones, but manipulating the personal choices. So that long introduction is to bring you to this, um, to be able to um, teach that to one another within Santa Cruz Guitar Company is really passing on this empirical body of knowledge that a lot of it is experiential. Um, uh, do you hear this? Do you feel this? Um, so my goal is to quantify that in a scientific vocabulary. So not only can we teach each other that, but also we can, you know, as an open source company, I want that available to the world. Um, so uh, imagine this. Uh, if, so, if if anybody in the world could go out and buy a guitar for uh, a few hundred, like more than a, a squawking box, but had enough 
complexity to inspire you to write songs and change the world. That's legacy. And uh, that's what we're working on today, and that's what I'm thrilled to do. Um, uh, uh, Laird and Richard Newman, uh, good friends and patrons, and also uh, real involved in the Santa Cruz Players Forum. It's an online forum that we don't uh, sponsor. They did that themselves. Um, have uh, uh, done a podcast as well where we're talking about these uh, issues. Um, and what we're doing with it is um, uh, luckily over you know almost half a century now, we've attracted the attention of some really uh, accomplished professionals. Um, uh, the acoustic uh, uh, lab at the Monterey uh, Postgraduate School um, and uh, Stanford University's acoustic program. So we're, be, we're able to work with uh, machinery uh, and uh, quantifying devices that we never dream of owning. This is like stuff only the military or a major university would have. And we can sample our instruments. We can sample uh, 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 the difference in when we manipulate something. And we're building this body of knowledge where we can it, or we'll be able to, in a science, with the scientific vocabulary, describe how we voice tune and manipulate a guitar to sound the way we want. So um, let me take a breath there. <laughs> That's a, a big project, and I never thought I would really get enough of a foothold on it uh, to learn uh, how to do this, because that requires a lot of subsets of knowledge and, and lifetimes of study. Um, uh, so what, what, uh, has always worked for me is, uh, you know, if, if I put out in, in prayer, what I'm hoping to do for others and I shut up and listen, I'll get inspiration, um, or I'll get things on my doorstep that I might not otherwise know. And, uh, in this case, uh, Rick Bartow that, that works closely with me at Santa Cruz Guitar, um, is a published quantum physicist. And uh, that is in, uh, you know, taking a lot of unrelated chaotic information and putting it together in a calculation um, uh, that makes them, that we can communicate with. And Rick's working with, uh, again, a, a graduate from uh, uh, Stanford University who's still teaching and has access to their stuff. And again, the Naval Postgraduate School. And we are measuring this stuff of uh, Rick's ability to, to, in math, can actually put it in the language I'm talking about. And there's nothing to show off yet, but boy, have we built a good foundation on that. And all the while, back to your question, I will, um, I'll train new people in, in uh, uh, techniques of guitar building. I will fill in for people on vacation. And I cannot, for the life of me, draw a picture of a guitar. So I have to sit down at the bench if I'm designing a new instrument. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of what's going on right now, or was until the uh, state told us to go home and stay there. Yeah, you get to, you get to just let that simmer. <laughs> what, do you feel the scientific stuff... Uh, the the measuring and all that you just described, do you feel like there might be some fundamental changes to how you construct these things that you could have never imagined? Or is it going to be just a lot of little refinements, this wood goes better with this thickness, that kind of stuff? Um, uh, uh, the Actually, the former. Uh, you know, we, 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 again, we've approached guitar making scientifically uh, all through these, we honor the scientific method, so it's not a scattershot approach to it, uh, nor are we like a larger company uh, trying to hit a price target and therefore count on marketing to sell our guitars. Uh, we're really concentrating on quality of sound. And uh, one of the one of the things I would say right here is a bit of a myth buster for uh, uh, for your listeners and subscribers is that uh, um, there are subjective things about the sound of a guitar. And, and again, those are the things you would uh, manipulate on your sound system, like EQ, volume, tone, uh, etc. Uh, and then there is the simple things that everybody wants and are the, the inspiration for all the 
wine type talk that we have about guitars. And again, the ability for the guitar to sustain and develop a complexity of overtones that make it sound rich, full, and desirable, and also inspire you creatively. That is doable, and the violin makers, uh, uh, the master violin makers, that's their tradition, and that's what they did. So uh, the folklore on the internet of this being, you know, every guitar is different and there's someone for every guitar. You really can't put this into uh, a quantifiable language is, is uh, fortunately not true. Uh, it, it is there. And I may be making this more complicated. I'm, I'm trying to simplify it. Uh, but making a spectacular sounding guitar and getting the things that people personally want in it is doable. And uh, uh, that's the information I'm trying to pass on. It's fantastic. Yeah, it. Uh, um, uh, I think that would make the world a better place. So there's one of the things that we're working on uh, currently right now. You know my passion for uh, uh, um, a responsible harvest and uh, uh, you know appropriate sourcing of woods and things like that. That could be a whole career in itself. Sure. Uh, but moderation, little things. Um, I'm a little ADD, and I need all of those shiny things floating around me. But I know better than to uh, throw my whole self into each one, uh, or I'll, I'll pop. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I mean, we've all had to. Uh, I mean, hopefully, some of us are still uh, doing some forest bathing and and getting outdoors. But we've had to stop thinking about the the trees for a little bit while we think about uh, washing our hands and staying inside. But where where is your head at with that? Where what what is exciting to you in terms of sustainable woods or woods that haven't been mined to death? Um, where were you yeah. at before we all had to hit the pause button? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the experimentation with alternatives and the alternatives are only alternative to us as, as modern steel string guitar makers, because anywhere you go in the world, people have made musical instruments out of what's available. Um, some, uh, some better than others, as far as durability, workability, and, uh, but that body of knowledge is also well developed, um, on a scientific basis, you know, you can look up almost any wood in the world and find out its properties and read whether it's suitable for making a guitar or not. Uh, the hard part is the marketing. And when we first uh, introduced, um, uh, look correctly here, reintroduced Koa in the 70s, um, people didn't, you know, except for the aficionados that remember uh, Martin's uh, Hawaiian era stuff in the 20s and 30s, um, it was really a hard sell. Uh, and it wasn't until I, I could get uh, Chris Martin and Bob Taylor to give it a try, uh, did it get it get some traction and become uh, uh, a acceptable uh, tone wood. So uh, today, you know, 40 years later, uh, people believe that we know what we're doing, it's a lot easier to bring a new wood into uh, the marketplace. But with that becomes comes great responsibility. We cannot uh, uh, experiment uh, uh, carelessly on this because uh, our credibility is what's the most important. And if we introduced a wood that didn't work well, um, people wouldn't trust our judgment. So we're really careful in the new woods we bring to the marketplace uh, in that same sense. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, we want sustainability, uh, we want to know where the sources are, and all of those uh, create a matrix that allow a wood either get introduced by us or, uh, or not. Yeah. What else are you working on? What else is, what, how, how do you, what books are you reading? What, what are you doing at home right now? Now, uh, uh, you know, reading is another thing that my uh, uh, my mother instilled in me. I mean, it's in my DNA uh, as as uh, you know, preschool and after school. Uh, as little kids, both me and my sister sat on the floor of the uh, you know uh, little rural library and read while we waited for my mom to get done. Uh, from work. And uh, so readings is something that, that, uh, you know, has to be a part of what I do. And uh, um, uh, what am I 
what am I reading uh, right now? Well, one of, one of the things I really had fun with is there's two books I read concurrently. I really read one thing at a time. And one was this, uh, uh, I can't give you the title right now. I can fill it in later. It's, it's the story of Okinawa in World War II. And it is really intense. It's about the, uh, um, I mean, the, the the hand-to-hand personal contact between people uh, fighting in a world war, and it's um, it's really more than I I can usually handle, and and it's, it's not the kind of thing I would normally read, but I'm reading it in conjunction with uh, uh, the spiritual texts of the time, uh, 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 Japanese Buddhism. Uh, uh, some of the some of the other less known stuff, and really getting an understanding of what motivated these people in this in this situation that was um, really unimaginable for us. It's incomprehensible that humans be thrown into this kind of thing, and how people dealt with it on both sides. You know, um, uh, the again people like my father. You know, coming from uh, 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 a cult that hadn't changed for generations uh, into this melee and then uh, the Japanese perspective. So that is really, really uh, a plenty right now. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't leave well enough alone. I've got a few other things going at the same time. (laughs) Um, One of my heroes, yeah, one of my heroes is St. Francis. And uh, uh, there is so much out there uh, written on him and written of him, and uh, uh, also, you know, from his, it wasn't a lot of his writings, uh, but what a, he's a spectacular influence and a great, a great uh, example, really, of how us as uh, humans, with all our foibles and selfishness, can uh, uh, live right and and have a right livelihood in times like these. So I always got to keep that uh, thread going too. Wow. You meditate? I, I, uh, you know, this is like your dentist saying, and how often do you floss? <laughs> you know, well, of course I floss. You know, do it, uh, uh, you know, yeah, let me answer it like this. Uh, when I meditate, the world's a better place. When I don't meditate, look out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's this simple. I mentioned it before. You know, uh, prayer is where you, uh, you know, you, you put out your questions, you put out your queries and your puzzlement and your confusion and meditations where you shut up and listen. And the uh, uh, inspiration, intuition uh, comes to you that shows you the next right thing to do. It's beautiful. So if I only do one of them, I'm not getting a balance. Just to bring it back to no, just to bring it back to guitars. This sounds kind of trivial, but uh, you you mentioned the uh, the reputation that Santa Cruz has, and you've got to maintain that. You have standards. You have uh, customers who expect a certain kind of guitar from you. When you walk around the Nam Show, or when you look online, if you're looking online, what uh, guitar makers, what guitars? Do you do you scratch your head and go, wow, that is really cool, and I could never put that out, but I'm so glad somebody else did. Oh man, now you know, uh, one of the nice things about uh, being at this season in life is you know a lot of people, and you love a lot of people, and you care about a lot of people. And when I start uh, giving short of, of, uh, of guitar makers that inspire me, I'm going to leave somebody out that's <laughs> going to make me uh, lose sleep tonight. Okay. So I'm really cautious of that. Nonetheless, I'll forge ahead. You know, I'll just, I'll just run into furniture and, and tell you. Um, you know, uh, there's a few people that that um, I've been in, you know, been in and out of my life for for years. And uh, uh, one of the guitar makers, guitar maker is uh, Claudio and uh, Claudia Pagelli uh, in Switzerland. Sure. And the, uh, the, 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 you know, freedom with which they think, uh, design, and uh, uh, execute things is, is you know, I, I want to say inspirational, so forth. It really is nutritious. It's refreshing. And every time I visit him, talk to him, or see what he's doing, I, I'll go, dang, I never would have thought of that. And uh, and and like you said, and that we won't or couldn't make, um, you know, that's not the nature 
of our business, our service is, um, you know, to to be able to build guitars for individuals and get them everything they want. Uh, Claudia, Claudia is to inspire the world and <laughs> what's possible, right? And uh, uh, each to their own uh, talents. And uh, I, so I leave that to them. But um, it, it's a place where I can look at what he does and there's no noise from my ego going, I could have done that. Oh, you know, I could have thought of that. I'm just like, I, I'm just inspired. It's like, uh, you know, uh, it's like nutrients, as I said. Um, you're familiar with with uh, uh, their work? Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. art. Yeah. And uh, uh, there, there's always something there. So there's a few people like that around the world. And we use him as an example because he's the most well-known that people would see. Um, but just like, uh, as you know, in music, there's like, there's people that are so impossibly gifted, uh, humble and can do stuff that you wouldn't uh, think was possible that nobody will ever hear of. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of them, there's a lot of them out there and that's why I'm hesitant to talk about the names, but it's the people that are stretching. Um, and I, and I'm going to say their motivation is, uh, not so much to um, uh, improve their standing, their personal standing in the uh, uh, community, uh, but to advance the craft. And that's where the best stuff comes from. You know, it, it's remarkable. So you take somebody like Claudio and uh, Claudia as a designer uh, working on their own, and then you take somebody at the other extreme uh, like uh, uh, Bob Taylor, and uh, uh, um, let's see, how do I say this out? Sound like I'm boasting. Bob and I go back a long way. Uh, I, I think when I first met him, uh, they had just uh, uh, him and Kurt, the original partners, had just hired their uh, first employee, and uh, um, they were making some impossible amount of guitars, maybe twelve a week, right? <laughs> At the time. So that's, not, that's how far we go. And uh, um, uh, uh, Bob is, is, you know, he's a titan of industry. He's an industrialist. He's also a guy with a great spiritual foundation, knows exactly where he is, and he knows exactly where he's going. And uh, uh, so working with him and seeing the works he does is just as inspirational because his motivations um, are a lot more free of ego than uh than most that we see um so there's inspiration in uh, some of the biggest companies and some of the tiniest guys that you've never seen i hope i'm not sound like a politician here no you're not <laughs> but it, it, but this makes me this makes me wonder um did you at some point put the brakes on santa cruz to keep it at a certain sustainable level or was there ever an urge to scale back further and become closer to a one-man shop or scale up to hopefully, you know, I mean, obviously Bob's created an empire, but um, did this kind of naturally work out with the team that you have? Or was there some thought behind it of like, if we're going to, if we're going to, uh, you know, check all these boxes that and, and set the bar that we've yeah. set for ourselves? I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are on that. Um, think that that is that's real evocative. Um, no, I hope I haven't put uh, bricks on the company uh, intentionally or inadvertently. Um, what uh, uh, it's from the other end, it's allowing to, it to uh, grow um, uh, or evolve truly, you know, to mature, uh, to ad advance in its effectiveness. Uh, in, as a natural evolution. And I don't mean laissez-faire, stand back and see what happens. I mean uh, to uh, make uh, choices that uh, uh, filter through the mission statement um, uh, instead of, again, many, many companies are based on, and some individuals are based on a price target. Uh, and to achieve the, that price target in the marketplace, you need to be careful how much money you spend on woods, how much money you spend on labor, and uh, the proportion you spend on promotion, right? Sure. Um, so uh, for Santa Cruz, 
I don't want that to be the driver. I want the driver to be uh, one person at a time. Uh, that we're building a guitar uh, that will give one person everything they want in one instrument, uh, and uh, as well as the inspiration. So I don't mean to sound that smarmy or, or mushy there at all. But with that, we can do our best work. We're not limited by uh, what we pay for materials, and we're not limited by the effort that we put in it. Because when we're done, we'll charge what it takes to build that instrument. Lovely. That's perfect. Well, it's it's scary, <laughs> frankly. It is, uh, and, and, you know, in shepherding this business uh, along, uh, that's exactly what I'm thinking each time. Are we, you know, are we serving our, our, our true purpose uh, in the decisions we make? And uh, one of those decisions, or I'd say many times that decision has been no I'm not going to take on this company as a partner for as a potential boss uh, just because it, it gives us financial security. Um, too many lessons we've individually learned and been told about um, uh, uh, how, uh, get, you know, money's not going to solve your problems. Uh, and uh, I could be, if, if I'd made the wrong choices, I could be really comfortably well-to-do and having to work for somebody in an office in Chicago and hating myself for my choices um, and uh, and had lost all the goodwill that I built with the people that work for me. So, uh, you know, along the line of those choices have to be made, especially at times like this of crisis, you know, uh, this is where people's real, real true characters come out. And this is what you remember each other for. So sometimes that's not the most profitable decisions, but if I'm prudent and thoughtful and I shut up and listen, you know, I can keep them pretty much in line. <laughs> I love it, Richard. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's, you know, I, I, Jason, you, you ask these beautiful questions and it gives me a chance to do what is really my job. You know, the guitar making is just a vehicle here. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, letting people benefit from the mistakes I've made and the experience that I had is really great. Um, as, uh, you remember when we were like 18 years old and we knew everything there possibly was worth knowing when we were ready to tell everybody at a moment's notice how to live their lives. Of course. And that, that's cleverness. And, uh, uh, you know, a lot of us that we deal with, a lot of people that you and I deal with are really, really clever. Um, now wisdom is another thing. Wisdom isn't something you're born with. It's something that happens to you if you pay attention. And, uh, you know, after the amount of time we've been on the planet, we have, uh, such a body of, of, uh, experiences, uh, anecdotal, uh, and uh, lived ourselves from not only our activities, but also what we've read, what we've heard, what we've seen in the movies. And when you're faced with a decision now, uh, well, let's go back to 18 years old. You would have done, you would have acted on your first impulse and gone out in the street and, and uh, marched to the death, you know, for a cause. Uh, today, you're going to do this comparative analysis of everything you've been given, and you're going to make a wiser decision that's probably going to turn out better. And that's what I'm grateful for. It's not because I'm clever or smart. I just been around a long time. Yeah, I love it. Richard, thank you. Well, I, I uh, this was profound that, or at a time when uh, we all need a little bit of it. So, amen to that. Um, uh, it, it uh, yeah, a little kindness goes a really long way right now, doesn't it? It does, even if it's virtual or uh, six feet away. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, I, I uh, you know, forgive me. I, I got a little bit of cabin fever. I've been holed up here for uh, uh, quite a while and uh, uh, haven't really been talking to people. So if I uh, overstayed my welcome, forgive me. No, but it's always we a can keep going. Talk but to yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> this was great. We'll do we'll just make this a weekly fireside chat. I think we could all learn from you. Just just you just start a book club, maybe. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's too much fun. That's too much fun. 
Uh, thanks, Jason. You you know you do a, a remarkable service, and I know that um, uh, there's a lot of people don't realize how much of Fretboard Journal is just you and what you put out. And uh, uh, you know I personally benefit from it, and I want to thank you for what you do. Oh, thank you, Richard. All right, well, take care of yourself. Okay, buddy. All right. You too. Bye bye. Right.